Welcome to NILA 2020 On Demand. This session was previously recorded for the NILA 2020 virtual conference. It is available to you through December 31st, 2020. Please note, once viewed, each on-demand program is eligible for one continuing education credit. Links to materials and presenter contact information have been archived in a Google folder and are made available after conference. Support files and documents can be found in session files below the program description. Any questions about the NILA 2020 Virtual Conference digital platform can be directed to Christina at nyla.org or you can call 800-252-6952. Information and Literacy Skills for High School Students is sponsored by ILRT and co-sponsored by SISL, SCLA, and ESRT. This session is information literacy for all um, real skills our students need to fight for democracy. I'm Elizabeth Hartnett and I'm the Oneida Herkimer School Library System Director. Um, below me is Jan Murray. She is the Instructional Support Specialist at um, Oneida Herkimer Madison BOCES. And below that is Kelly Moses. She's the librarian at Marcellus High School. And below her is Roma Matat. She's a librarian at Sherburn Irville High School. Okay, so in today's, sorry, in today's program, we're gonna give you a little bit of background information about this course that we created. We're gonna tell you about the process we went through um, and then how we piloted it. Um, and then we're gonna actually get into explore the course. So the first thing that we kind of had this discussion about a, a while back, and we, we at our Oneida Herkimer Madison BOCES kind of termed, um, coined the term digital culturation. And what it is in 1950, the researchers said that's when the digital revolution began. And we figured at some point we'll have digital assimilation, but in the process in between, um, and assimilation to a different culture, typically to the dominant one, we're calling the dominant culture being a digital culture. And so this process we're calling it considering is a digital acculturation. And through this process, we have moved very quickly, but we have not given the skills that are needed to um, our citizens and our students. So that was kind of one of our thoughts are, how are we going to fix this issue? So um, one of the things we thought was, how do we get the state to start making this a mandate? Because we think everybody should have this course as, um, as a graduating high school student, just like they have health. Health education is mandated. And we think they should have an information literacy course as well. So how do we get them to do that? There's a very long, lengthy process to get them to do that. But maybe if we just build a course and say, look how great this is, maybe we could get the state to then say, okay, it's already here. And um, now we'll, we'll make it a mandate. So the process that we went through um, in about 2015, we identified this need, and then we also identified standards. Um, and this was done regionally with uh, regional librarians. Then uh, from 2017 to 2019, we worked on designing the lessons, and we'll get into those a little bit later in this presentation. Um, from 2019 to 2020, we did field testing. And um, from the field test, we have then modified some of the lessons from the feedback. And then of course we're piloting again, and that's gonna be a continuation of modification. Obviously with, when we're talking about information literacy, digital literacy, we're talking about things that are gonna to need to be modified almost daily. Um, but we have the course ready to go and it's ready for a full rollout um, right now. Obviously some other things have occurred that we didn't plan for. And so things have um, kind of gone a, off course for right now, but we're, we're, we're gonna hopefully get back on track by next year. Uh, so one of the things that I was first tasked when I first came to Oneida Madison, um, Oneida Herkimer Madison BOCES was about um, research. A bunch of 
local graduates came back to the area and there was a panel with superintendents and they asked the graduates, what are the skills that you didn't have that you needed when you went to college? Um, and they said research, which is, you know, as a librarian, school librarians, we try to do research with all the students, but there's so many barriers to being able to get that done, whether it's um, teacher availability, library availability, student schedules, it, it's, it's a not an easy to do process to get all the research to every student. So one of the things we did was we um, consulted with uh, our academic librarians from our region in, in Utica um, and with high school librarians and secondary librarians. And we talked about identifying all of the skills that would be needed for a 12th grader as they graduate high school to be successful when they enter college. Um, and one of the biggest skills that they need, or it's maybe more of an understanding, is that they need to be able to understand that the librarian is somebody that is approachable and is there to help. So that was the, it wasn't um, plagiarism or anything. That was actually the, the biggest takeaway we had. Based on that bridging the gap um, meeting and experience, we then developed these grade 12 exit skills that uh, teachers and librarians and college teachers and librarians decided that our seniors needed to have when they leave high school. Uh, we use the Empire State Information Fluency Continuum as standards for these grade 12 exit skills. <clears throat> we also created a K6 skills matrix um, based on the ESIFC based on the AASL standards. Um, and we created this matrix and we kind of filled in those gaps. Oops, excuse me, I just made a bunch of noise. We filled in those gaps um, as to what it would look like for K-6 students to build the foundation to establish those grade 12 exit skills. So the outline for this K-6 skills matrix was developed by local librarians uh, in a PLC group. We all work together to create these lessons uh, and it's going out now as a K-6 curriculum that is optional, certainly not something that's mandatory, but an option for school librarians and for teachers on special assignment or anyone just getting started or looking for fresh ideas in the K-6 library to use as curricular ideas. Uh, next slide, please. After we created those K-6 skills matrix and the lessons and the grade 12 exit skills, we came back to this idea of students needing research and we created this all online secondary course that's really designed for students in grades 9 through 12. And the course is called Civic Reasoning and Digital Fluency. It's an all online or could be done hybrid class um, that is for high school students and it uses the Buzz platform. That's something that we use a lot here at OHM BOCES. Uh, and it is computer based and testing aligned. So it's really easy for teachers teaching this course to track student data, to build assessments, to garner assess or to gather assessment data, things like that. Next slide, please. The course has six units. We'll talk a little bit more about lessons within those units a little bit later. It is 80 lessons. Each lesson is designed to be approximately 40 minutes long to fit into a standard secondary class time period if needed. Um, you can see the units over on the right hand side. We've got an introduction to digital literacy, internet safety and privacy. We address fake news information evaluation and lateral reading ethical media production, digital wellness, and the research component, which is the last unit. The resources that we used to build this course came from all over the place. We created some of the resources ourselves, we made videos, we recorded ourselves talking or explaining certain concepts. We used Novel New York resources that are provided to everyone in the state. We use some YouTube videos, some crash course videos, if anyone is familiar with those John Green um, educational videos, that series, those came in really handy. We used Shed, 
articles and lesson plans, which SHEG is the Stanford History Education Group, and they gave us permission to use their lessons in this course. We used different articles that we found online, really everything that we could come up with that we could find that seemed like the best possible article or video or resource in general to get across these different concepts. Next slide, please. So hi, I'm the librarian from Marcellus High School, um, and I wanted to share with you um, our course catalog description. Uh, I'm not going to read it all, but just um, kind of a, in a summary, it's a half credit course, so half year semester. Uh, at this point, it's offered 100% online, but it also could be hybrid as well. Next slide. So the middle school, which are uh, grades seven and eight at Marcellus, were interested in the course. So we decided to have some students pilot it. There were eight students total, eighth grade, 100% online, and students self-selected two to three lessons from units one and two. All the students have different lessons, so there's no repetition. And students started the week before everything was shut down um, and then they completed by either end of March or early April and they provided feedback. We used a Google form and in the next slide I'll go over some of the questions that we asked. Um, and we thought at 7th and 8th they could either use select lessons um, or they could um, to satisfy that New York State requirement right for library and information skills or the full course, so depending on the content. And then at the high school, like I said, it's offered as a half a credit for grades 9, 12. Next slide. So the feedback form, like I said, it was in Google Forms. Um, the first question, um, all our lessons are meant to be um, within that 40 minutes. So we wanted to make sure that the lesson wasn't too long or too short. So that was their first question. Um, then they had a one major takeaway from the lesson. If anything was too hard or too easy, um, and then relevancy to their, to their students' lives. And then suggestions for improvement. And that question, should the course be mandated? Um, I will share some comments actually from students in the next slide. And then they had um, any questions or comments. No, you're fine. Next slide. <laughs> um, so in response to the question, so should this course be mandated for all middle school and high school students, there were um, a couple of student responses. And the first one is the internet is an important aspect in our lives. I feel it's important to bring awareness to the impact of internet rights. Hot topic right now, especially now that we are um, hybrid, right, virtual students, and then some in person. I believe this should be taught to high schoolers because we live in an era where our personal information could end up on the internet without us even knowing. So even the students understand the need for a, a course like this. Next slide. Hi, this is Roma Matad. I, um, at the time that I piloted this course, I was the librarian at the Tilton School, which is a special ed school. We have students first through 12th grade, and I actually uh, taught this course with eighth graders all the way up through um, seniors, and um, we learned quite a bit um, going through and actually teaching the class. Um, first of all, we learned that the lessons are really tailored to the students, which in a special ed environment is incredibly important. They're self-paced. So I had some students that would complete an entire lesson during one class and then other students it took maybe two or even three classes for them to finish it. Um, my students um, were not necessarily, um, had, did not necessarily have lower intelligence, but a lot of times they had gaps in their learning and you'll see that in some of the responses. So it just depended on the student and where they came from um, and what they were um, able to accomplish in 40 minutes. So they were all self-paced. Um, also, the lessons were really easy to differentiate. I was able to add video, audio, infographics. A lot of the lessons have all of that already built in, um, which is really great for different types of learning and different learners. I could also do one-on-one -on -one instruction when it was really needed. So if I had a student who didn't quite grasp a concept, I could pull them aside um, and teach them one-on-one, -on -one, um, which was really important to help them understand the concept. Um, so I actually ended up teaching this class kind of in a hybrid. For the most part, I let them 
um, do it on their own. But if I saw a need, like I thought that they were not really getting the content, I would actually jump in and, and do like a mini lesson. Next slide, please. They learn more than just content too. I think one of the values of doing like online learning and online course like this is that they learn how to navigate online interfaces. Um, almost everything in our life now is done online on some form. So it's really important um, that students have that exposure. And I know we assume that they know how to do all of that, but actually they really have some learning to do. So this kind of course really gives them a great introduction on how to uh, work with content online. There's also the power of the redo. One of the nice things about the online environment is that if a student almost got to the finish line but not quite there, I could ask them to redo it again. I could probe them or push them a little bit farther um, just to get their learning uh, ratcheted up a notch. So that's really important and it's empowering. It teaches them that you know failing once isn't the end of everything. You can do things over and over again and that's the success. It also really allowed for peer peer-to-peer -to -peer teaching. Uh, sometimes I would have uh, a student who was struggling with a concept and there's the person sitting next to them grabbed, or grasped it really quite quickly. And so that person would be the teacher and actually uh, work with the student who was struggling and get them to understand the content. So there was a lot of collaboration and co-working amongst the students as they went through this content, which was really powerful to see. Next, con no, next slide, please. So I talked about um, a little bit about um, doing different types of differentiation. Um, one of the nice things about this uh, course and the Buzz platform is that you can provide additional resources at the point of need, which really allows you to clarify concepts for students. So on this screen, um, you'll see um, with the blue, this is actually an answer that a student gave to one of the questions. Um, and he was answering the question about net neutrality, should it be put back um, in, in effect? And he got it close, but not quite there. So in my feedback, I was able to tell him that, and then I gave him additional resources that he could read. So I actually linked him to another article, which maybe might be easier for him to understand um, and be able to answer that question. And then of course, I allowed him to redo the assignment so he could demonstrate that he had grasped it. Next uh, slide, please. You can also like target the feedback. So you can uh, really probe them, um, the students to think more about a subject and give more detailed answers. Sometimes students just like put in information, um, but with the, with the targeted feedback, you can really push them and try to get them to give more detailed responses, um, which helps them develop their learning. So uh, they were asked to, um, they had to pick a way of communication that was used in the past and talk about whether or not it was a good way to communicate and would it be a good way to communicate today. So this person had picked uh, smoke signals and he was asked if it was an effective way to communicate today. And he's like, yes, because there's danger going on almost everywhere today. And so I was like, okay, all right, but um, if you wanted to signal danger, would you use a smoke signal over another kind of communication? What about using smoke signals makes it a good way for someone in today's world or is it? So by being able to target that feedback and actually looking at their answer and pushing them a little bit farther, they can think more and become more engaged in the content. So um, this platform really allows for that. Next slide, please. They also have the power to choose their learning and choose not only how they uh, get, how they access the information, but how they demonstrate what they learn. So this is an example on, on net neutrality. They had a choice activity and they're are these choice activities throughout the entire course. Um, in this case, they could uh, choose a letter a to write a persuasive letter, or they could actually watch a video and answer some questions. So my student here decided to write a letter. Um, and so he wrote a letter about why net neutrality is really important. And again, when we talk about targeted feedback, you can see on my answer, um, I said, this is good, but you need to put it in letter format. And here's what letter format kind of looks like. Again, a lot of my students just had gaps in their knowledge. So um, sometimes being able to provide this targeted uh, feedback was really very important for them. So they learned more than just the content, but they more learned a way of communicating that's really important. Next slide, please. So the other really powerful thing about this course is it really allows students to evaluate, um, synthesize and evaluate information. Um, in unit one, lesson two, they're asked to write a persuasive, persuasive essay on whether or not they think the internet access is a human right. So my student um, actually was at the House of Good Shepherd and um, they are not allowed access to devices uh, because they're a high risk uh, population. Um, they run away a lot. and. Uh, put themselves in danger. So they're just not allowed to communicate with anybody that's not authorized. 
So she took this lesson that she did on internet access, is it a human right? And thought about it in terms of her own situation. And she said, it's not a human right, but it should be. Um, and she gave reasons why she thought it should be a human right. Um, and one of them was to be able to access her, have access to her family and friends whenever she needs to. So it's really important as students are learning this information that they are able to take it and evaluate their own situation and process that information about why it's important. Because once they make that leap, then they can start to look at the world through other people's eyes and see why it might be important for other people. So it's really important um, in this course because it really does start to ask students to think about these bigger questions about how to evaluate information and, and what does it really mean um, to actually um, get critical information. Next slide. Okay, so I'm going to take over. This is Jan. I'm going to take over the screen sharing and I'm going to show you what the course looks like now. So bear with me while I share my screen. Okay. So here you can see I'm signed into my Buzz platform. I am signed in as a teacher, so some of the things that I'll see in the course are a little bit different than what the students will see. I'm enrolled in a lot of courses, or I'm a teacher in a lot of courses, so I see a lot of things here. When I sign into the course, um, as a teacher, I see different folders that students will not see. You'll see that there are red dots on some of these folders. That means that the students can't see them, but I can. So the first lesson that I want to show you is in Unit 1 in the Introduction to Digital Literacy Unit. It is Unit 1, Lesson 2. The lesson is titled, Is Access to the Internet a Human Right? And I believe this is one of the um, ones that Roma had talked about doing with her student as well, um, or along the lines of the net neutrality um, discussion that Roma had with her student. So every lesson looks the same. We try to be consistent with our students so that each time they click into a lesson, they know what they're getting. So the landing page here is what we're seeing. The landing page of each lesson has a summary, essential questions, lesson steps, and there might actually be um, some vocabulary um, for some of the lessons as well. Underneath that, you'll see the activities for each lesson. And again, I see as a teacher the original files that the students wouldn't see. Each lesson has a lesson opener. Again, they see the different activities on the left-hand side here that are within each lesson. And then there's an introductory video to show students and to explain to students what they'll be doing in that lesson. I'm just going to click on this quickly so that you can see. Unit 1, an introduction to digital literacy, lesson 2. Is access to the internet a human right? Your essential question for today's lesson is thinking about, is the internet a basic human right? In the last lesson, you learned about the evolution. So you can see that each lesson starts with a PowerPoint, and, and we really try to address different ways to reach students and interact with students. So in, in addition to that landing page that we saw here, we've also got the video opener introduction to show students what they're going to be doing that lesson, and they review a little bit what they did the prior lesson. So I'm gonna get into this activity, is the, is Internet Access a Human Right, to show you what some of the activities in this course might look like. You'll see that students have directions to the activity, so it'll tell them exactly what they need to do. Watch the video below, and after watching the video, scroll down to the article and read through the article. So I can see that I have the video there, and I have an article from The Guardian that's embedded. So students will watch this video right in the platform. In 2016, the United Nations declared access to the internet and freedom of expression online a human right and condemned any efforts to hinder people from getting online. Scroll down and read the article, and then I have my question below that. Is access, is internet access a human right? You must provide at least three pieces of evidence from the video or article that supports your argument. So here students can type in, they can 
format their answers, and then at the bottom right, they can either save and exit and finish completing their answer later, or they can submit all answers. I also think that this is a good activity and a good unit to show you, a good lesson to show, because we really are focusing on digital literacy and information skills, but it is all based on a bed of civics. So we're talking about digital media skills, we're talking about digital literacy skills, we're talking about internet access, but we're also forcing our students to think about human rights and what is a human right and who has access to these things or who should have access to these things that we have access to. So that's the first lesson I wanted to show you. Next, I have a lesson from Unit 2. Unit 2 is Internet Safety and Privacy. And then we have uh, Lesson 16, the Unit Summary and Review. This one was pulled out because there is potential here for this activity, um, for this lesson and activity to be more collaborative. Um, I'd also just like to um, encourage my colleagues here, if you want to jump in at any point and add on to what I'm saying, please feel free to do so because I know that I have a lot of this presentation and our, our viewers and listeners are going to get sick of hearing my voice. So again, here's our lesson platform. We have our um, landing page, we've got our lesson summary, essential question, lesson steps, and this one has some vocabulary included. We've got our lesson opener. This one will look just like the one that I showed you for Unit 1, Lesson 2. And I wanted to show you here this internet safety activity. This one is a lot more reading. Um, I'm not going to read the whole thing on camera, but you can see that there's more of an assignment here that students need to get involved with. Um, for this assignment, they must do two things. They must write an article, essay, or speech here, and then, then they must also design and submit an infographic to support their article, essay, or speech. So in this activity, students are taking on the persona of a professional who consults with businesses, schools, or individuals, and they are this internet safety professional. They are the expert. So they have to either write an article, essay, or speech from that expert perspective who's teaching someone either in a school or a business or something. Um, they get to choose who they are and who their audience is. And they need to teach that audience as if they don't know anything about internet safety and privacy. And then they have to build an infographic to pass out during their presentation. The submission for that is down at the bottom. So during in this submission box, I'm a teacher, so you can't see it how a student would, but they can just attach their documents as attachments there and click Submit My Work. This one offers a lot of potential for students to do collaborative projects or even projects with, within their greater community. They could actually go out and interview people or work with different professionals or even present their article, essay, or speech, and their infographic to different organizations and professionals and help teach someone about internet safety and privacy. One of the great things about having this right here in one platform is that as a teacher, you could decide, you know what, I want to make that a choice activity, or I want to give them a third choice of letting them do an interview, or um, maybe they want to do a presentation on, you know, presenting to parents about what's what you should know of what your students are doing online. So, you know, the teacher aspect would give you a lot of freedom um, to decide what, how you wanted to teach it and what you wanted to do. The next lesson and activity that I want to show you is in unit three. It's in the fake news information evaluation and lateral reading unit. The lesson that we're looking at here is lesson 18. It's photo manipulation. Again, we have our landing page with our summary question steps vocabulary. Our activities are below. Now at this point, you might be seeing these and noticing that they're different colors. Uh, we did choose our icons carefully. 
you'll see that this opener is always blue and it's always got a camera icon. That means it's something that students don't have to submit anything for and they're watching a video. If it's something that students do have to submit for, the background will be yellow. The eye means that they have to read an article. The camera means that they have to watch a video. Um, so we did try to be consistent so that our students would see those icons and know exactly what's expected of them for that activity. We also thought that that would help with different differentiation needs that students might have. So again, for this lesson, we've got our opener. And I wanted to show you this real or fake activity, I believe is the one I wanted to look at. Yes. So this is another way that the lessons can be set up. The ones I've showed you so far are ones that scroll down um, for students to see what's underneath. The directions are on top and the activity is below. This one is a side by side for students. Again, we've got our directions here and this activity, they just have to go through and determine if these photos that they're looking at are original or if they're photoshopped and they can select their answers and go through to the next one. I don't actually have all the answers in front of me, so I'm just arbitrarily clicking. And then students can click submit all answers. It'll ask them to confirm and it'll tell them right away if they got things correct or if they got things wrong. So I got less, or I got um, this first one I got incorrect. The second one I got correct. I have a green check mark there. This one has a red X, so I got that one incorrect and it tells me what the correct answer is. Some of these also, you'll see that there is a description. So this one tells me a little bit more about these flowers. This is an original flower and the, it's titled Nuclear Effects Flowers. They are actual flowers in nature. Um, so we can provide feedback for students that way and teachers, whoever's teaching the course can also go in and choose to add or provide their own feedback for these activities and questions. Students then have the option to retake in the bottom right hand corner and they can fix their answers and they can reevaluate or reassess themselves. So again, we're really asking students to think critically about things that they see every day. Our students are always encountering media and a lot of the media that they're encountering is images. If you think about students, they're, they're interacting with memes probably more of the day than they're not. Uh, so how much of it is actually real? We're really asking our students to think about what they're looking at on a day-to-day -day basis and be a little bit more critical about what they're seeing, what they're posting, um, what they're putting out in the world as well. Next, we have unit four, lesson one. Unit four is ethical media production and lesson one is a lesson on pop plagiarism. I wanted to show you this one because it really shows how with these lessons we are doing a lot that needs to be updated, but we're also doing a lot that is relevant to the students. So we will go through and make sure that pop plagiarism continues to be pop plagiarism um, so that students can really connect and evaluate what, what is relevant to them. So again, our landing page is the same, um, our lesson opener, and then these two activities really play off of each other. So the directions for this activity, the students have to first listen to the one YouTube video, the song Under Pressure by Queen, and then they have to listen to Ice Ice Baby by Vanilla Ice and identify similarities and differences. Then they have to say, without any background, whether they think Vanilla Ice plagiarized and explain their reasoning. Now, most students in the high school have heard of the term plagiarism. Um, so we're really just kind of asking them to use their prior knowledge here. Then the next activity, students have to watch a video about plagiarism and take a few moments to complete the questions that are based on the last activity and this activity. So after watching the video about plagiarism, they're asked, what is plagiarism? What do you already know about plagiarism? 
true or false, plagiarism only occurs when writing papers. So we have a mix of written responses and multiple choice responses here that students have to go through. So we're asking them to think critically, not only about what they're looking at at the moment, but what they've already seen in this lesson and in prior lessons. Our unit five lesson that I'd like to show you, I actually have two lessons for unit five. Um, the digital wellness lesson we thought was, or excuse me, unit we thought was very important to include because while media literacy is something that pe people aren't really addressing in schools, we're certainly not addressing digital wellness. Um, our students are online a lot. And we all know as adults, as parents, or as teachers, or both, that being online can really affect young people in different ways. Um, we've seen a lot of students with anxiety and depression, and, and really just a lot of screen time isn't great. So we ask students to evaluate themselves. So lesson one, social media regulation. They are introduced to this media diary assignment here. This media diary assignment asks them to keep track of their media usage for the next seven days. It says keep track of what type of media you're using and how long you're using it for. You can also choose with permission from your adult to download the tracker app for your phone. So they can set up a chart like this one or they can use the template and print it out or fill it in online, whatever works for them. And then seven days later, in lesson eight, the digital addiction lesson, we come back to that media tracker diary and we ask some questions. We ask students to turn in their media tracker diary and then also answer some questions about it. What was the total of number of minutes that they were on for the seven days? What day did they spend the most time on any media? Why do they think they spent that most the time that day? When did they spend the least time and why do they think they used less media that day? So you can see that we're asking them to not only think critically in the moment, but to go back and think critically about what they've been doing and how they've been acting and to pay attention to their media use and their digital consumption. Much of this course is not linear. It really spirals. Um, a lot of the things that we addressed, we had a hard time deciding actually what unit we should put the content in because it's it's so connected to, to the content from earlier units. And um, one of the things that you'll notice as you go through and see these lessons is a lot of it is talking about the regulation of information or the freedom of information. And that's the, that's the underlying theme of the entire course is to get the students to think about information as a freedom. Who has the right to control information? Who has the right to control the speed of it? If social media should be regulated, who has the power to regulate it? Um, you know, and who do we want to regulate it? So there's a lot of questions that the students are asked and, and even to reflect on their own um, information usage, but also like, what are, the, what are the bigger impacts on the world? Um, and then another thing I was gonna say about digital wellness, a lot of the kids, all they hear about is you're, you have too much screen time, too much screen time. So the digital wellness actually goes over some of the, the the positive aspects of social media. And I think, um, you know, during this COVID shutdown, a lot of teenagers, that was one of their only ways to stay connected with each other. So, um, and th these were all written before COVID happened, but it, um, you know, some of those things, we don't wanna sit here and tell the students everything they're doing is wrong. We wanna tell them everything you're doing should be thought carefully of and should be regulated and you should self-regulate. So those are what we want to make sure the students are hearing from us. Um, we have a, there's a whole thing in here about Wikipedia and that Wikipedia is not evil, but it's also not the best resource, but it's often a good place for you to start your research. So um, just kind of some of those things that, that maybe um, we've been teaching a little bit differently in the past. We want the students to really listen to this, this and we want to talk to them on their level. The last thing in the course that I want to show you is unit six in general. Uh, let me open this up. Unit six 
um, looks a little bit different. You can see that we have nine lessons in unit six, but we've also got this research paper requirements and that has been pulled out of any of those individual lessons so that students have quick access to the requirements for this unit so that they don't have to try and remember to dig through what lesson it was in. So they've got their directions, they've got their rubric, they've got their um, grading scale and everything that's easy to access. Within this unit, uh, we have really the basics of what is a research paper and why should I have to do one? How do I find a good research topic? Um, narrowing down your topic and doing some pre-writing. We generally don't, throughout this whole course, we generally don't direct students to one specific tool or another. However, during the research unit, we do have to include some things that are more focused. So we talk about how to write a research unit or, or excuse me, a research paper using Google Docs and different Google tools to keep your research and your information organized. And we also talk about using Noodle tools. So we give students two different options. Um, Noodle tools is something that we as OHM BOCES provide for all of our um, member schools. So it's something that all of our students have access to. So it's a way for them to organize their research and information. But we know that not everyone across the state might have access to that. So we also talk about using Google and organizing your research with Google. We have students looking for different sources. We use databases, um, database resources. We really focused with the Novel New York resources. So things that are not being purchased individually by districts and things that every student across the state would have access to. We also talk about primary versus secondary sources and have our students finding a primary source. We talk to our students about lateral reading um, and how to question the information that you are getting by doing lateral reading and opening up other tabs and finding out about the authors and the creators of the information and comparing information sources. We also talk about how to use websites to research. Then we've got different note taking, um, a mini lesson on how to write a thesis and an outline, and we have our students doing an outline, um, rough draft, editing and proofreading. And this unit really is pretty compact in nine lessons. It is definitely something that if a teacher is doing a hybrid model or just even all online wanted to add more lessons and spread this out a little bit, that's definitely doable. Um, but we gave the content there. So after we did this whole course and this research unit, we realized, wow, a lot of people probably are uncomfortable teaching research um, in the classroom if they're not high school English teachers. Um, and we've kind of had that experience as school librarians. So we thought, this would be a really good time to create an online research unit. So we pulled out a lot of these research lessons and some lessons from other units and we created a whole larger course that is just a research course um, for teachers who are doing online or hybrid teaching to use with their students. So if they need help doing research or coming up with a research plan for their students, we've got all of that laid out right there in a I think it's a 13 to 15 lesson research unit. And again, that is something that teachers could extend if they needed to as well. So those are some examples of the lessons in our course. Um, you can see the different topics and ideas that we try to cover while we're talking about digital media with an underbelly of civics. So I'm going to go back to our slideshow here. If I can. And I don't know, did any of my um, coworkers, did anyone have anything that they wanted to add before we get into any feedback or demo requests or anything? 
Um, no, I, I just, uh, we know that it was a very long process for us to create this. Um, and, um, and we know it's going to have to be continuously um, modified and evaluated as the times change. We have this Google form here. You can see the link if anyone is interested in requesting a demo of this course um, for their school or their district. Um, please feel free to um, fill out that form and request a demo and we can get demo accounts set up that way. And thank you, everyone. Yeah, thank you for listening. Great, thank you so much. Um, we will be sure to archive this um, link to this form and the sessions files below the um, information about this program on the site. And I just wanted to say that this concludes the NILA 2020 on-demand program, Information and Media Literacy Skills for High School Students. We hope you continue to take advantage of all the on-demand and live programs the NILA 2020 Annual Virtual Conference has to offer. Thank you for helping us make this the best virtual conference ever.